much did the landscape of Port-au-Prince change? I mean, so the interesting about thing about Port-au-Prince is that it's so hilly that there's a lot of times when you get these really amazing views or you know, where you can see a lot. So as we were driving on the mountain um, towards the embassy, you could just see, you could just look at all the houses and just were just gone. You know, you could just see everyone that had collapsed. So, I mean, at night when we were looking over, we were on the roof of Ann's house and we were, you couldn't really tell, right? It's night and there's a couple of lights on, people have backup generators, the electricity actually was kind of gone completely off by that point. So it's like eerily, like you look out over the town at night and it's like, oh, it's, you know, can't even really tell. Which is why at night nobody knew. They're like, maybe we'll wake up and everything will seem okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I think that's why they were like singing. They're just like, maybe everything's going to be okay. But then when you, in the morning when the sun was out and you were driving over these mountain passes, you could just like see everything. Like you could just... And that was the, those were the worst moments, and those were the moments when I, like, turned to Mariah, and I was like, Mariah, just look at me. Just, like, I'm going to tell you something where you don't have to look. Because I don't, I mean, she's just such a sensitive soul, and I just didn't, just didn't want her to have to see it. And I remember, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem like the worst image, but I just saw this man just completely naked, rocking through the streets. And for some reason, the sight of it was so shocking to me that all I could think was, like, I don't want my eye to see that. He wasn't even injured. I'm not really sure why it should have been that big of a deal, but I guess just, like, the vulnerability in that of, like, it, this man just lost, not knowing where he was going, with no clothes, just, like, how, like, just really had no, completely nothing, right? And nowhere to go and nothing to even wear. And I, I, I that just hit me, even though there was, like, you know, again, you just, you, you, cut, you grasp like random images in your mind because you can't take the whole scene in. You don't know what to look at. So like he's walking and you know, there's dead babies here and buildings collapsed here. And I think I stopped looking at the buildings because they, they told me they had seen a school where you could see the children and the rubble. And I just, I didn't want to see things like that. So I was like, I, I think I was just looking at like the individual people. I don't know. It was, just, it was really hard to process yeah. watching that. So yeah, the landscape definitely was. You could. I don't know. How did How did you know not to go back to your hotel, or did we you go back? Didn't. Okay. So the first night we tried to go back to the hotel, we didn't. We had no idea. We heard some reports that Paytonville was fine which is not true um, now. So we were like, okay, we can go back. And they're like, yeah, you're going to go back. It's going to be fine. We're going to go back. And they tried this amazing man, Giles, who's actually uh, IT guy at Ron Grisette, is driving us. Again, I told you, his, probably he didn't know if his family was alive or dead, and he was trying to get us somewhere. And he drove up, and then he drove down, and then he drove up. And every time he tried to go up, you couldn't. And there were these amazing people out that were directing traffic and clearing the roads, like business guys, like Haitians that were just, had taken off their jackets and were like directing traffic, which like nobody would have gotten anywhere without them. Again, just like these amazing people. And so you could kind of get like horizontally because of them, but like at some point going up, you just couldn't go anymore. And we tried four different roads that went up and we couldn't do it. And so... Then we tried to go to the ambassador's house, same thing, couldn't do it. And Ian's house was right around the corner from Ron Grisay, so they were like, we're just taking it easier. And we were like, okay. And then in the morning, the hotel was too far to walk. So we were like, we need somewhere where we can walk. We can't walk to the hotel. And when we were in the embassy vehicle, we kind of wanted to go back to our hotel, but it seemed like they, they were going to take us until we picked up a bunch more Americans. But it's one of those things where you're kind of still holding on to, like, maybe my stuff is still in that hotel. Maybe it's still standing. But, like, and we also, we were really worried about the owner who had become our friend. Like, we really wanted to see him. And I still don't know about this, but there were these, uh, these Dutch 
couples that were staying in the hotel where we were. And we, and Josh one day struck up a conversation with them, and he's like, what are you doing here? They're like, oh, we're all adopting children. And we've been in this, like, five-year logistical paperwork, whatever, gone through this whole process to adoptation orphans, and we're finally getting them. So these Dutch couples that were all, like, coming down as a group, obviously kind of needed support that this is not an easy process to go through. And they picked up these kids, and we got to, like, watch this, like, first interaction with these parents with their new children. And it was such an amazing sight. Except for the fact that I still, you know, three days later, I've no, I've not heard a word about the hotel. And I know that they didn't have anywhere else to, they weren't going anywhere else. Because they were just hanging out with their kids before they flew. So they weren't going to meetings. They were just there as a pool there. And, like, the little kids were playing in the pool and stuff. So I know that they were there, but I don't know if the hotel was standing in, and I don't know if they have their little kids anymore. Um, and I'm sure there's a million stories like that, but, you know, it's just like you think of the people you know, and it's crazy to think that two weeks ago I wouldn't know anybody maybe, and now I know 50 or 60 people, and, you know, I've kind of fallen in love with the country in a week. It's like an amazing country with that. It's just... Uh, dealt with so much. I read an op-ed that burned so well, like this country that God seems determined to destroy. <laughs> it's like, how can this happen to them again? I mean, they were like, Juan Jose was just saying, like, they had just finished rebuilding from the hurricane, and they were like, in the process of a group, finally, we've gotten 87% of the loans we paid from the hurricane, but, you know, we had a bunch of people to rebuild their houses. We're finally, like, going to do some really exciting, innovative programming. We're getting these diaspora people back. They're so bright. They're so motivated. They're so committed. Everybody's just so excited. The CEO is getting an Immigrant of the Year Award from the government. She was like, finally, the government's recognizing I've been here for 14 years. I'm, you know, she's an American, but she's, like, she's also Haitian. Finally, the government's going to give me some credit. She's so honored. And then boom, like everything's got all that hard work. But like, you just saw so much good stuff. All these entrepreneurs, all of these people that were coming up with these great ideas. We were meeting with Digicel and small entrepreneurs. And there's some kids that I would talk to. Everybody that like, we just had. And you know, like, we even before the earthquake, you knew that there was like really, not really that much hope for them. No matter how hard they tried, like, the land's destroyed. Like, there's no real industry. There's no real agriculture. You know, like there's so much aid money. There really was a lot of aid money even before. And there's all these committed people that we met with and all of them say the same thing. Like, we know, like we're CRS and we know that the fact that CRS has been here for 40 years and still looks like this is the pathetic. What is the point of aid? Like what? And like, and that's why it's just so hard because like, I mean, they're having such a hard time with the humanitarian relief now, and it's like, and and even though you hear in the news, like, we know that this country was not that getting it back to where it was isn't good enough. Like, there's recognition in the media of that, but I don't, I, I still don't have any hope that like that recognition is gonna do any good because. It's just gonna. It's just so much worse off. I mean, the government has nothing. The government that already had nothing has even less. The Ministry of Finance is down. Like the Ministry of Education is down. The palace is destroyed. Like the money. Like any money that they had, any resources that they had are all gone. The prisons collapsed. I mean, you have to have prisons. Like they're gonna be rebuilding those basic things while the people are still on eating and. They were already malnutrition. There's so much food insecurity, and now, you know, and that's why you can't get food to them fast enough. Like, you or me could, like, survive for four days without that much food. But if you're already malnutrition, you can't. They still have, like, all their public transportation. Like, there is, like, completely, like, it had the brightest colors, like, every single bus and every single truck that um they take of all pain in these like bright like really but you know like you think of like kind of new orleans creole style like so fun and like there's like so there is um carnival it's supposed to start there i'm